Microphone check. Everybody's in the house tonight. Wesley Anson's in the house. G. Markey, Ken Havens, Kevin Ropke. Whoa, Kobe, Warren, Bu- Warren Buffett's here. Warren Buffett represent Alex A., Stephen Lippold. I'd like to see some of the regulars back, some new faces, some new avatars. Mark Isakoff, what's happening? No, we're not doing air tags today. Kenyon LaPierre, what's happening? Uh, you need clubhouse invites? I ain't got any. Uh, I've been giving them out like like uh, like they matter. Um, we're gonna talk about clubhouse tonight. All right, Michael Batnick is here. Downtown Josh Brown, your host, is here. Duncan is here. We're doing viewer topics. We're talking about everything going on on Wall Street this week. It's a very exciting place to be. Thank you for coming by. Every Tuesday at 5.30 Eastern, we run it back, uh, and tonight is is just beginning. So let's get right into it. Hit the, uh, hit the thing, Duncan. We'll go. Did you... Um, did you ever? Uh, wow, you got the whole, you got the name and the shirt. I didn't even realize you had the shirt too. <laughs> Very nice. Do you have Elizabeth Shue's phone number? I wish because that would really complete the. Uh, okay. Do you? Did you ever meet John Roke? Yes. I know you know who he is. Yes. When did you meet him? Uh, he came to the office a few times. Okay. Love, lovely guy. Like the sweetest guy ever, right? Yeah. John is. Uh, all right. So Roke's like one of my favorite technicians, like as a person. I know his work is high quality, but like I go by people. Um, so John used to work for George Soros. He was, I think, the only technician there for for his tenure. Um, and now he writes for Wolf Research. And he was talking about ARC relative strength versus the S&P 500. And he's not a Johnny come lately on this topic. He's been following the, the, the momentum crash since February that's been taking place relative to the S&P. And the slow motion tech topping that's been taking place last summer. So I want to go into this. I think we made some charts. We don't have John's charts um, because they were maybe a little too complex for video. Uh, But this is ARC Innovation ETF price, and this is the simple moving average. Well, let me ask, what's the significance of 126? I don't know. I I don't think that's the point. I think the point is it's not in an uptrend and now hasn't been Eh, for a couple of months. It's debatable. Okay. Okay. I think there probably is a reason that he's using that specific moving average. Maybe, maybe it translates to some sort of weekly thing. Listen, I think I think this depends on your time frame. Clearly, the longer te- term trend is still up. The intermediate term trend, not so much. Okay. Do we make a relative? Uh, do yeah, we, we make did. a relative to the S and P? Let's pop that up. There we go. So to me, this is the point because the market still. Yeah. Uh, I know the last couple of days have been a little bit choppy, and there are some sectors falling off, but for the most part. The market doesn't look like this. The market looks great. Yeah. This segment of the market has not really recovered yet. It's it actually looks like it's going to take out new lows. Um, what's the best way to explain this? It's really just like it's it's a it's just the arc divided by the price of the S P five hundred. So it's comparing sh- it's comparing one versus the other. Just a straight up ratio chart. Um, so Roke is Roke is looking at arcs relative momentum versus the S and P, saying it's at the lowest level since July twenty twenty. Uh, maybe, quote, maybe we are just being overly cynical, but when relative momentum for an item is making a nine-month low, it is no longer a leader and hasn't been once since early February. Uh, what do you think is going on here? Just too much money came in, and now they're disappointed with recent returns? Yeah, I'm trying to look uh, to see if this is the first time. Now, this is this. is I'm just eyeballing this chart. This looks like the biggest relative drawdown. So you've had drawdowns in ARC over the years, Right, you've had you've had plenty of shakeouts along the way, but to your point, Josh, never when the overall market was going higher. So, I guess the question is: Is this just a pause? Is this normal? Um, yeah, I think it's all those things. Does does can there be more downside? Yeah, of course there can be. I mean, this thing is a very volatile name. So, I think the longer term trend is still up, but there might be short term more pain in the short term, which sounds like a total pundity thing to say, but that's what I think. There are a lot of illiquid, smaller cap stocks that make up. Not just ARC, but some of the other ARC ETFs or Momentum ETFs. Well, hang on, but that's important because these names, this one, this one in particular, is huge. They have gone up the market cap, cap spectrum as more money has poured in. So their top ten holdings, you've got Tesla, Square, Teladoc, Roku, Zillow, Zoom, Spotify, Shopify, Baidu, Exact Sciences. These are big, big, big names. For the most part, these are big market cap stocks, and then some of the category. ETFs in this space, like space ETFs, genomics ETFs, 
they by definition have even smaller holdings and there really aren't large holdings that can be in them. But uh, about, about a month ago, we were saying that some of the sell off in tech was because of interest rates rising. Well, it's interesting because the interest rates have pulled back and these names haven't really bounced all that much. I mean, there's been a few bounces, but I mean, Square looks good, but like in general, they're not looking too hot. If you look at like Teladoc, for example, it looks like shit. Like a lot of these names look pretty busted. So, so you had a crypto um, pullback over the weekend, which I think is somewhat related to money flowing out of these types of funds. I want to pop this magazine cover. So our friend Scott Galloway, friend of the pod, can we say that? Friend of the YouTube channel? Um, friend Scott, of the balds, definitely. Yes. By the way, Scott is, Scott is the man. Uh, this is like an interview with him in New York Magazine where Max Reed, who's a very good writer, we talked about him, I think, here last week. This is a good article. Uh, yeah, this is a really good article because it's just like, what what the hell is going on? And nobody really can answer that question. It captured you know? the current zeitgeist like perfectly. Yeah, like nobody does it like Scott, I guess what I want to say. But I just feel like all of these things, they're not all one trade, um, but they all are interrelated because it's the same people hyping a lot of stuff up. And I don't mean hyping it up like in a negative way. People are excited. The Cuba's and, hyping Dogecoin. Yeah, it's a little bit, it's the, a little, it's a little bit weird. Like, let me just, let me just say one, one final much. thing. Let me just bring it back to the Ark thing. I think the thing that Roke is saying, and I didn't read his piece. I'm guessing is that the, these names are so obviously the momentum leaders, and that's gone. And so when these momentum names are no longer lead, and then it's probably you know maybe the trade's over. We'll see. Ready to move on? The implications though are are greater. It's like. You know, if all of the excite excitement goes out of the market via these stocks not working anymore, what does that mean for everything else? Well, does counterpoint, it benefit everything else. SPACs are blowing up, right? I wor I saw worst week, worst month ever. Demand has completely dried up. Like nobody's interested, and the overall market hasn't noticed. So that's kind of bullish. Hey, could you be bearish on like if your example reason to be bearish was they just did three hundred SPACs in the last six weeks? Blah blah blah. It's a bubble. And then that blows up, and then you're bearish because it's blowing up. It's like, what? Well, which do you want? Do you want the bubble to collapse, or do you want it to keep going? What would make you less nasty right. to everyone else right. around you? <laughs> well, no, no, nothing. But what nothing. if somebody told you three months ago, last point on this, what if somebody told you three, six months ago that these high-momentum names were going to blow up, some draw down 45 50%, and the market was going to shrug? You wouldn't believe it. So to me, that's pretty, that's pretty bullish. Um, all right. So far, yeah, I, I agree with you. Is okay, what do you got? So Jeff Bezos did his final letter, uh, Amazon letter CEO. I just want to give you some numbers before I ask you the question. 200 million prime mm. members worldwide, 1.3 million employees who earned $80 billion in 2020, 1.9 million small and medium-sized businesses sell on Amazon. Uh, in 2020, they profited between 25 and $39 billion. AWS, $50 billion annualized run rate. Is Jeff Bezos, I mean, this is not, you know, going out on a limb. Is he the greatest founder, CEO ever? Yes. Okay, next question. Do you think that's, <laughs> wait, do you, like, do you think that's even controversial anymore? No, no, I don't think so. I think maybe, I mean, no, I don't think it's controversial. Who well, what, do we who? what do we want to judge it on? Do we want to judge it purely on, like, who came public as the founder, stayed as CEO, and well, generated the most return for in, shareholders? In value creation, I don't even think that's that's not debatable. That's probably a, that's a fact. Uh, in, not in terms, debatable. In terms of changing the world. So listen to this. So Ben actually just wrote about this. But in his shareholder letter, he spoke about the time that he saved customers. This is wild. 28% of purchases in Amazon are in three minutes or less. Honestly, I think I'm like 30 seconds or less. I, I, I go very quick on Amazon. Uh uh, half of all purchases, <laughs> half of all purchases are finished in less than 15 minutes. What do you wait? Hold stop. What are you no. ordering in less than three seconds on Amazon? I don't shop. What, I, know, I know what I want. So you just, the first version of it that you say, you don't read anything. You just click buy. I don't shop. I know what I want. No, I understand that, but you don't care if there's two different versions of something. Whatever the first one you saw, just hit enter. I don't shop. What, what, what are you I, so I bought, busy? What are you so busy doing? I don't know. I I I, I placed five hundred thirty-two orders in two thousand twenty. Maybe Robin shop. I, I don't shop. You probably did too, dude. We were home the entire time. So anyway, he said, if you assume that the Amazon purchase, uh, what? Wait, what? 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 How did how did you place five hundred thirty-two orders in three hundred sixty-five days? Go to your purchase history. I'm sure you did too. Mm, I'm sure I didn't. Do you right. mean 532 items or 532 individual orders? 
I don't know, man. F- uh, probably orders. I don't know about that. That doesn't sound possible. Seven days a week buying shit on Amazon? Your orders. So it says placed. Yeah, it says orders placed. Holy shit. Okay. In 2020, no, I, don't, I, I, placed I don't know if fi- it's possible for me. I placed 532 orders. Okay, anyway, he's saying that if you assume that a typical Amazon purchase takes 15 minutes a week, and it right. saves you a couple of trips to the physical store a week, which I don't who goes to the physical store a few times a week, but whatever. That's more than 75 hours a year. So conservatively, they say 75 hours, $10 an hour, subtracting the cost of Prime. So talk about value creation. Each Prime member is, is he, so he equates that to $630, which is for 200 million Prime members in 2020. That's $126 billion of value creation. Let's say that's wildly inflated. Let's say it's $50 billion. So what? That's It's so much money. I'm lost. That's like how much pe- time people spent that they could use doing other things. Correct. If your time value is Value creation in dollar terms is probably not the way to measure that, but I get I think what he's it's trying reasonable. to say. Well, if, you're, if you value your time, let's call it 10 bucks an hour. What's it worth to you? Most people don't value their time. So what? I, I know what t- I know what the top ten TV shows are in the country. I I know what the top ten on Netflix are. If people value their time, not none of that would look that way. There are people that are still killing time in this in this world. Let's face it. So I think that's a bad Non-sequitur. measure. But I but I but I I get what he's trying to say. I think more. I think more to the point for me. Even if you told me, Josh, we we crunch the numbers and. Uh, uh, John Rockefeller created more shareholder value if you do inflation adjusted, blah, 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 bullshit. He had the the world, basically, the country certainly, in a stranglehold. Amazon's the opposite. They're the monopoly that consumers love. It, this is That's what's so unheard of. Nobody's complaining about Amazon's prices except, because except the prices except, are the lowest. Except some sellers on the platform. But yes, consumers love Amazon. But the whole business is not focused on let me commandeer this scarce resource and then gouge everybody to become the most valuable company. It's the opposite. Let me make people so happy that they never buy things from anyone else but me. And that's an exaggeration, but that's really what he built. To me, it it looks much more like Walmart or so, or the Woolworths or some of the great retail dynasties, except he's better at it than they were. Did you read the letter? So, yeah. One of the things that letter. stood out was he said that above anything, above everything else, he's an inventor. That's how he sees himself. So to that point, he said, in 1997, we hadn't invented Prime, Marketplace, Alexa, or AWS. They weren't even ideas then, and none was preordained. I mean, he he did it with, with, this market, with the big team. Should this market cap be uh, the largest in the world? I mean, it's what's $100 billion short? Yeah, Yeah, probably. I think it should. I think so too. I think like if you said to me, Amazon's the largest company in the world, that, that makes more sense to me than, Apple. than any, any of the other. Yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. All right, uh, what do you got? All right. Love that story. Uh, I can't believe they added, by the way, uh, 50 million prime users in the last year or in 2020 <laughs> or whatever. It's bananas. I wanted to ask you about where am I going? I don't know. Clubhouse. Oh yeah. So yeah. I know that you, you and you and Ben are on spaces now. I love it. We love it. Twitter Spaces. We love it. Why do you like? Why do you like it better than Clubhouse? We never had this conversation. I, well, because all my people are on Twitter. That's why. So, all right, you have a bigger built-in audience sitting there waiting. It's just all yeah. Okay. Do you have all the same functionality, like deciding who else can talk, pulling yep. people up on stage? Yep. yep. With what are the different? So you could have Android users in there, not just iOS, because Clubhouse hasn't done that yet. I honestly didn't even know that. Okay. Uh, is there any other difference in the functions other than just you have a bigger built-in audience there? Yeah. What What else? What, do you, what, else, what, else, do you, what else do you oh. like about it besides that? Is that no, the I'm, main I'm not thing? Saying, I'm not saying I love Twitter uh, spaces over Clubhouse. I just – I love the idea. I love the platform. Okay. Uh, this is uh, CNBC.com. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg on Monday announced that the company is building audio features uh, where users can engage in real-time conversations with others similar to Clubhouse. This is why this motherfucker needs to be broken up, by the way. And I don't even know if he'll build a good version of it. Everyone's doing it. Dude, Pulte Holmes is building a clubhouse competitor. <laughs> <laughs> Campbell Soup is building a clubhouse. Uh, all right, here's TechCrunch. Reddit unveils its clubhouse clone, Reddit Talk. Um, on the heels of Clubhouse's latest fundraise, Reddit officially unveiled its clubhouse, Reddit Talk. So basically the same thing. It's a mm. chat version of Reddit. Uh, so if you have a big audience on Reddit, which... Or is it? T- so I think what all these things have in common 
is that these are social networks not built around cults of personality, but really built around topics and common interests. So it makes sense that people would rather have a vocal conversation than a typing war uh, with each other, especially if we all have AirPods in all the time. So I understand why they're all building this. Can they all live? Like, would it be okay if there were like 10 different versions of Clubhouse? Yeah, maybe. I don't know that this needs to be a winner take all, but uh, the value, what's going on? So Clubhouse just raised more money at a $4 billion valuation. I mean, what's the difference? It's so much money. But there was, so Chris Cantino tweeted that the installations are stalling out. So there we go, $4 billion. So you had, you had 9.6 million downloads in February when it blew up, 2.6 million in March, 643,000 in April. Yikes. Because we're going outside. Who the fuck right, wants to listen right. to people have random bullshit com the other thing is there is too many um too many uh what's called alerts. Like I have alerts I turn, turned I turn on for this. I, I turned them off. You're nuts. Why do why do I need to know so I follow all these rappers, obviously. So I don't need to know that the game is starting a new room every fifteen minutes. I don't know, is he even rapping anymore or is he just doing clubhouse? So it's like five people, Cat Cole who I think like was the CEO of Cinnabon. Apparently she has nothing to do but talk for 20 hours a day. There's like the same people that right. the, the phone keeps buzzing me. So Silicon Valley, I mean, they're doing Clubhouse a shitty also, job with the updates. Clubhouse is all Silicon Valley people. I, th I, I don't think there's a limit how many they can be. I don't get the valuation, but whatever. I guess $4 billion is nothing these days. All right, last thing on this. How many minutes can you spend in a Clubhouse room? Can you go over 60 minutes or would it be really hard for you? Because I know you don't have much of an attention span. Me personally? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I can't. No, I, I'm in and out. You I kind of view it like I kind of view it like a TV show, like or a movie. You want to jump in and you know you stay until you're entertained and then you bail. Yeah, so it's hard to stay entertained because people can't see each other, so the conversations they're having are very like stilted and like people trying not to like step on each other's that words. Part, that part so of it is awkward. Gaps. That part of it is awkward. I was listening to one the other week talking about whatever doesn't matter, and uh, people are all over each other. Okay, now that we've trashed Clubhouse thoroughly. Uh, look at the description of this video and make sure you click on it if you want to uh, listen to The Boiler Room, which is this Friday. It's me and Jason Rasnick from Benzinga. We write up an article, all of your stock pitches. We have a lot of fun. Last week, we broke a record, Mike. So I know installs are going down, but we had the most, we had hundreds of people in the room, uh, dozens waiting online to, uh, to pitch stocks. So I think, I think there is a growing audience for some types of content there. Maybe just not for the whole thing. Yeah, no, I didn't trash. I'm, I like I like the idea. I like the platform. Yeah, uh, they should they should let the speakers make eye contact with each other somehow. Okay, what do you got? So one of the so last week was pretty dumb in general with with Dogecoin. Ben and I got into this is a Jake Paul fight. I mean, the Coinbase IPO. I don't want to say that was dumb, but just it, there was a lot a lot of noise last week. One of the pieces of noise was this hundred million dollar deli. I forget what it's called. Uh, doesn't even matter. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. What's the difference? I mean, it's a fake. It's a fake deli. It's not a fake deli. The deli is real. What? The stock is fake. Yeah. Whatever. Okay. All right. No point taken. So, I think Einhorn was saying that this is this is sign of the times, and maybe. But Barry made it. Barry Ritholtz made a great point on Bloomberg TV today. It's like, listen, it's on the pink sheets. Like by definition, it's a scam. This is this is. There's no macro implications of a scam being on the pink sheet. Like stop the presses. Yeah, that's where the scams are. You could find. Plenty of scams on the pink sheets. Now, this is a great story. It's extraordinary, but this is not like the the Fed is not doing this. I would never, I would, I would never go against the family and take Einhorn's <laughs> side over Barry. I was watching Einhorn Godfather. <laughs> Watch it. Don't ever go against the family in public. I'm not. I'm not gonna Fredo anybody. I'm. I would just say back to Barry. If I were on that Bloomberg segment, I would say, dude, Einhorn put a throwaway sentence about this thing that was not the gist of what he was talking about. <laughs> it's just comedy. It's funny. Right, um, and Barry loves that throwaway. He loves yeah. throwaways. But uh, I was laughing because the fucking scams never change. Like, I watched guys bring a bagel store on 3rd Avenue Public uh, in, in the 1990s. I watched guys literally take a bagel store public. <laughs> and the pitch was they're going to open one of these in every city in the world or whatever. Uh, but it was a complete and total scam. So, you know, pink sheet, like the whole, the whole thing. And, uh, hometown, so the, Inter hometown international. What a name for a deli. I'm bullish. I don't care. I, I don't know. I, I, I like this pullback. I think it's a buying opportunity. I don't, I don't know of anyone who's ever gotten rich shorting delis. So you're not going to uh, short Capicol. 
I'm not sure that a gabagool. Yeah. You got you got it wrong. All right, listen. All I'm going to tell you is this is an old scam, not a new scam. And we don't even know what the scam is because it's not like they're trying to do anything with this stock. Unless we find out they have a telemarketing firm that's calling people and pitching the stock, which maybe is true. I let me I do it. I don't really know let what me, the crime is here. Let me ask you a boiler room question. Mm. Uh, would you rather what's more attractive, hundred million dollars for the deli or four billion for for Clubhouse? Hundred million for the deli. I don't know. I, I, have, I, I wouldn't. I have a two day time frame. Two day time frame. I think you want to be. I think you want to be long short both. Okay, let's do weed. It's four twenty. I'm not a, a weed guy. I'm a tequila guy, but I I respect I I respect everybody's personal choice and what they do in their spare time. I was time. wondering why you put this in here. I, I forgot today. Was four, this used to be a holiday for me. I used to be a, a big marijuana guy. Yeah, I I grew, I grew I out just, of it. My body can't handle it anymore. My brain can't it, handle it. it destroys I think me. It, I think in college, like 25 years ago, like on 420, I would have been like an idiot sitting on a blanket, like trying to get girls to talk to me, um, you know, with weed. But like, that's not, it's not really my thing. However, I was looking at the market caps uh, of the largest cannabis stocks. But first, I want to give you this information from Gallup. I'm listening. So, all right. So last week, Gallup asked Americans um, if marijuana should be legal for recreation. 60% 60% said yes. Uh, 30% said medical use only. Only 8% said no. Who says so no? Like a, Come on. I don't, I, I don't know. So it's, basically, so it's basically done, right? Like it's, it's a fait accompli. So if this is the case, uh, first of all, I don't think you can get 90% of Americans to agree on anything, <laughs> right? So, so like literally, I don't even think you get 90% of Americans to agree on like a, a TV show or a movie. So I'm um, looking at the market caps here. You know, Til- Tilray, Tilray was the original meme stock. Remember that? Rosh Hashanah 2018, 2019? Okay, well, this thing is tiny. It's $1.4 billion. Okay. It's basically been wiped off the face of the earth. What are the, what are the big ones? The biggest one is Canopy, which changed its ticker to weed. And it's uh, 9.4, which is respectable. Uh, I don't even know if that would put it in the S&P 500, though. Even if they were to put it in, it might not be big enough. Uh, the site I'm looking at has Scott's Miracle Grow, SMG. But... 13 billion but that's not really a marijuana stock you just i guess you need soil i wonder if these are like good businesses i don't know i don't know anything about aurora cannabis aurora cannabis is 8.2 billion cura leaf is 7.5 gw pharma is 6.7 all right so what these are if you look at the space it's this really bizarre mix some of them are head shops like a chain of marijuana retail stores some of them are a chain of stores, but then they also manufacture their own in-house products, like edibles, whatever. And then some of them are like equipment to growers. It's like all over the place. That's and the one that I want to buy. What? The one that so, sells the so equipment. So that's, that's Scott's Miracle Grow uh, and Green Thumb Industries, GTII. Like I would, that's I don't, a $5 I would, billion dollar market cap. I don't know that you could like pick one shot, one distributor versus the next. You know what I mean? Like That seems like really hard. Why is there no like blue chip company that does all of the things that I just listed? There will early. be, right? Still early. Somebody's gonna do that. Okay. Um, I think I think the alcohol company's gonna end up owning this sector. Just my personal opinion. So, all right, what do you got? All right, so Jimmy Kramer paid off his my house. Boy. Paid off his house uh, with Bitcoin money. Good for him. I hope he's so, paying the taxes. So there are forty five. Uh, different cryptocurrencies with a market cap north of a billion dollars. Mm. Those 45 cryptos represent almost $2 trillion. And it's not like $2 trillion went into the space, right? So there's a chart. Uh, I was asking Twitter, like, does anybody know how to calculate, like how much money went into, went into Bitcoin? Bitcoin's got a trillion dollar market cap. How much More. of that is just money out of thin air, just profits? So I think it's around 60 to 70% in profits, meaning... Of the one trillion dollar market cap, roughly three hundred billion dollars was that was actually purchased, right? So we're talking, yeah, we're talking real numbers here. So my question was, what when are gonna when are people? Maybe it's already happening. Going to start like taking some coins off the sideline. I'm not saying everyone's gonna sell at once. That's, that's not that's not where I'm going. But these are these numbers are so big that there might be like some real world implications for people behaving this way. So you've got ten thousand, ten was it ten ten thousand uh, Bitcoin millionaires. And uh, and uh, 
No, more than that. 100,000 Bitcoin, I'm sorry, 100,000 Bitcoin millionaires, 10,000 Bitcoin people own $10 million worth. So if, if, if somebody's just like peeling off 3%, I mean, that's real money. Yeah, but that money is in the, in the real economy. How so? All right, pull up a chart of uh, race. This is Ferrari. Okay. Who the, fuck do you who the fuck do you think is buying Ferraris like with a straight face right now? It's, this is all this is all Bitcoin all right, uh, millionaires I mean, and billionaires. That's that's not great. That's not, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just being I'm just being honest. That's like an example of like you ask like where is that money going? How about that's Hamptons? Where, that's Ham, Hamptons real estate. Miami? No, Miami real estate. No, Hampton old money. Miami, Miami. Miami is the crypto capital. Yeah. So go to all right. So there's a so what, if, what what if Bitcoin causes inflation? It it probably does. Probably does. You know who's really bad? Go go on Instagram and follow Dave Grootman. You you want to see somebody benefiting from crypto who probably doesn't own much crypto? This guy wakes up, plays tennis, has lunch with a celebrity, who then goes and person? sits at one of his nightclubs or restaurants. He just opened a hotel with Pharrell, uh, the Good Time Hotel. His so Miami <laughs> is like the Miami is the <laughs> new party capital of America. All these Bitcoin people and rappers and models are sitting at this guy's nightclubs every night. You couldn't you couldn't have a better life if you tried. Man, this guy looks That's like he's where having, the Bitcoin like, money's going. This guy looks like he's having fun. I mean, could you imagine? No. He owns uh, Club Live, which is the highest grossing nightclub in America. He was doing well. He was doing well before the pandemic. And you would think nightclubs, restaurants, this guy's fucked. Things couldn't be better. He's in Miami and everybody's spending crypto money that they didn't earn. It couldn't be a better situation. So I like I, you asked me, where's the money going? Uh, StockX, mm. Virgil Abloh, right? Off-white. This top is shot. Crypto, top shot. NFT. Right. Wow. That's, that's where all this money's going. And God, God bless. I, I'm glad it's going somewhere. Uh, anything but sitting in a treasury ETF. All right. All right. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Duncan with some viewer topics. Okay. What's up, handsome? Hey guys, how are you? What's How's up? Going? Hopefully, my picture looks a little, little better today. But coming in stream hot. yard sometimes, just for whatever reason, has trouble. What's the Washington Nationals record right now? Are they they looking better than the Yanks? Who cares? I actually don't know. I can't watch their okay. games up here very easily. So, by the way, I st I'm going to the garden tomorrow. Are you? Yeah. Do you have Do you have to get a test? No. You could just go. Do you have to yep. show a COVID okay. ID thing? Oh yeah, yeah. Playing Excelsior the pass. Game. All right. Cool. Very okay. Exciting. Well, so this week we got a lot of really good questions as usual. Uh, and so first up, Peter writes, with modern monetary theory and the U.S. government's use of it during the COVID-19 pandemic, will the U.S. ever experience a recession again? Or will the U.S. government now be forced to send checks to everyone at the first sign of economic weakness? What do you think, Mike? Can we unlearn what we just learned last year? No, nope, there's, there's, there's no going back. Here's, here's, here's my take. I know this is a question for Josh, but I think there's no going back. Once every, the difference between this time and the next time is that everyone knew on March 12th that we were in a recession or about to be in one tomorrow. Tom Hanks, Rita Wilson, Rudy Gobert, everybody knew at the same time. So everybody knew, oh shit, we have to do something. Oftentimes, the market is already 30%, 40% lower before everybody agrees that we're in a recession. So there might there will be political pressure but not everybody's going to agree that things are bad, right? Like think about Kudlow. I don't remember when he said like the economy's fine. It wasn't fine. So I, 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 I get the point and I do think that this is the way going forward, but I don't think that bear markets are off the table. What do you think? I would go even further than that. I don't actually think the recession is necessary anymore for the Fed and Treasury to act. Now they team up and just start giving money to unemployed people randomly in, in an expansion too. I think the next time in you an see- an expansion? Listen to me. The I'm next listening. time you see it, the next time you see a natural disaster like what we saw in Houston a couple of years ago, remember the whole city was flooded. Yes. Or God, and I'm, by the way, this is all God forbid, right? Yep. Wildfires, floods, tsunamis, whatever, whatever. Uh, you're gonna just start seeing money drops. This is they they just taught themselves to do this, and now they're like the man with the hammer. Everything looks like a nail. This is the new reality now. Is politically driven money drops. For anybody who's temporarily affected by anything, recession or otherwise, I think that's coming. But let me give you the second part of that. The thing that's going to make it possible is the digital dollar, which probably within the next five years is a thing that really exists in real life. This is the government literally having the ability to do dollar transfers without even using banks. So what are the implications for the stock market? 
I'm who, if who I were if I <laughs> yeah me right. I, if if I were a, a bank CEO I'd be very nervous about the Fed being able to transact directly with individual people which right now is illegal but with a digital dollar backed by the Fed that could change a lot of the mechanics of the way the government stimulates the economy and how directly it works with individual people. Um, and so if they start bypassing the banks and they start not even waiting for an actual recession but reacting faster, I, I'm not saying we won't have a recession. I'm just saying things are going to be different. Yes. All right. What do we got next? Okay. So next we have John all the way from New York writing, big fan of the show. I have a question that I'm hoping might be beneficial for other viewers. I'm 22 and have been an investor for four years now. Having just started my career, I'm beginning to build wealth steadily, but I know little to nothing about taxes and tax law as it pertains to being an investor. How would you direct young or beginner investors to start worrying about taxes? And do you have anything, you know, any big tax related mistakes uh, that too many people make that they should know about? Do all of your day trading in an IRA. Okay, that's that's what I got for John. What do you got? Uh, that's good advice. I so. I'm not a tax expert. I'm not even a tax knowledgeable person. I don't know anything about taxes really. But the biggest mistake that people make, I got an email actually last week from somebody, I know this, saying that, hey, I've been investing for 20 years and now I've got all these gains in a taxable accounts. Is there anything I can do to mitigate my, mitigate my tax bill? Yikes. Too late. Well, not too late, but pretty much too late. Yeah, for, for next year. <laughs> for young <laughs> investors, what you can do is, to Josh's point, if you are going to be transacting, do it inside of a tax sheltered vehicle. But more importantly, Contribute, make contributions. Don't leave that that money on the table. If you're a young person, uh, you can pr you're probably below the cap on a Roth IRA. Do that. Do IRAs. Do, invest in your four hundred one k. Like take care of that first and foremost. Um, that yeah. I would say that's probably the biggest mistake that people make is not taking advantage of that. So the term Mike's using the, the what Mike's describing the term is sorry I have a alpha. Yeah, what oh. I'm sorry the term is um, asset location. So asset allocation is like, what do I own? Asset location is what type of account do I own it in? And what tax advantages can I utilize in order to pay the least amount based on the type of trading I'm doing? Um, but yeah, I mean, theoretically or, or conceptually, just keep in mind, the longer you hold things in an account that's, that's taxable, the better off you'll be. So try not to um, engage in an investing strategy that requires you to transact all day. And how about this? Consult you can't with, eat pre-tax uh, returns. Consult with the tax with the tax person. They're they're CPAs. They're you know they do this for a living. So talk to one of them. Absolutely great. Okay, uh, we're gonna try to take one more, Duncan. Or what, what do we we we'll take one oh, off the stream? Fidelity, go get them. What happened? Uh, this person has an interview with Fidelity tomorrow. I saw Fidelity. I, actually, we just spoke about this on the on the show uh, on Animal Spirits. Fidelity's hiring a thousand CFPs. I think. Ooh. Th yeah. Okay. Why? Uh, I mean, I know why. I don't know, it's like the whole value of <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole value of the business these so, days. Uh, right. so, so I got a tip. Yeah, just I know this is like cliche, but be yourself. Try not to fake it. Like it's very it's very easy to know when a young person is is bullshitting, and that's not impressive. Uh, I didn't do that with you, Josh, when I spoke to you. I don't think. I think just Dude, just, you, just just be yourself. You did the opposite of that. <laughs> you I think the first words you ever said to me were, "Let's talk about this tomorrow." Because I definitely had a couple of drinks tonight, but I just wanted to say hi to you or whatever. Like, that was like your opener, which I found charming. All right. We're going to leave it there. Hey, uh, y'all make sure if you haven't smashed that like button, like, we, we, we really appreciate it. So let other people know that this is a good show and you're enjoying it by hitting the like button. Make sure you're subscribed if you haven't already. Check out the Goldmine podcast if you want to hear from Mike, myself, Ben, Barry, Blair, Tadas the whole gang in an audio format and we will be back here on the compound channel live next tuesday at 5 30 eastern love you guys see you next time